Thank you for joining us on Public Square today. Ellen, I would like to start with you. I wonder if you could give us a general overview on where we are nationally in terms of ensuring that all children are getting quality early learning in order to foster maximum brain development, something we all want. We're very advanced in terms of what we know about children and how to promote their best learning. The science has taken a dramatic leap, particularly neuroscience, in helping us understand how best to um, promote children's uh, learning socially, emotionally, and cognitively, and physically. Um, practice is a far way from what we know. There's a real disconnect between what we know and what we do. I think, though, we have made progress. And where we've made progress is that we used to think that learning started when kids started school. We now know that learning at least begins at three or four, um, but I don't think we've really caught up with the opportunities that we have uh, for families and the people in their lives to promote the best kind of learning for infants and, and toddlers. And I don't mean pouring knowledge into an empty vessel. I mean that give and take um, that warm and caring responsiveness where if the child makes a noise, we make a noise back and we really s respond to it. We, we can be, all, all of us can be brain builders and we're not doing that. So we have a long way to go. But the one promising thing, as you said, is that President Obama did say that he's going uh, out on a far political limb to support preschool for, for all children. He talked about infants and toddlers. He talked about um, wanting to have it a really quality program. I think we know from research on practice how to do it well, too. I mean, it's not just that we know child development research. We know research on practice about how to promote early learning in the best possible ways. But again, there's a gap um, between what we know and what we do. Talk about that gap. Why is there that gap? The gap has been part of our American psyche. Um, we believe in America that children are the property of their parents and that we would be interfering um, and that people should pull themselves up by their bootstrap. And we also have a notion about poor people, that they're lazy and that they don't do enough. What people do to manage when they're poor, for the most part, is incredible. We need to understand that we, we all have to help each other. Let me give you just one example. There's a study um, that a man named Felton Earls did dividing up Chicago neighborhood by neighborhood. And he was looking at very poor neighborhoods, and they were looking at the level of violence in the neighborhood. What he found is that in the neighborhoods where people have what he calls social efficacy, that if two kids are fighting, two little kids are fighting near you, you don't say that's their problem. You, feel, you as a citizen feel a responsibility to step in and help. It's the sense that other people's children matter to us all in those everyday ways. And in neighborhoods where people feel a sense of responsibility for each other and each other's children, there is much less violence. So our mythology is out of sync with our reality. And it doesn't mean that we have to abandon our American ideals, because we're also the pioneers who helped each other raise the houses. So I think we just need to redefine pioneers to have the notion of let's all help each other. Let's help to make sure that children uh, thrive. We will all do better. Linda, I know you work all over the state with um, schools working to engage parents. Talk about that. How can public institutions like that start working with parents so they know what they should be doing to engage their kids. We are all looking forward to, to the day when the following scenario is no longer in place, where a principal walks into an early childhood classroom and looks around and says, oh, I'll come back later when you're teaching. <laughs> what we want is, um, is leaders that understand good brain development, good child development, and can support both parents and teachers um, moving that forward in, in healthy, productive ways. Many of our principals, and we have one um, in the room today, are very knowledgeable about early childhood, but we also have a lot of leaders that, that are not. And so how do we engage them to think differently around what does effective early childhood practice look like and effective means to bring parents in and partner with them in ways that are authentic and warm and welcoming and meaningful, not just platitudes and lip service and inefficiencies. What are some of the challenges around that? And Peggy might want to chime in on that when you're trying to engage parents. 
I think a, a really big part of that is the culture and the atmosphere that you create in your school. And we have story time, which is developed for toddlers, two or even one to five years old. We have it in English, we have it in Spanish, and now we have it in Vietnamese. And we really see ourselves as the hub of the community. And when people come in, we ask, how can we help you? How can we be of service of you? What can, what can we do for you? Instead of, uh, please sign in, get a visitor's badge. What are you doing here? We have to make sure everyone's safe, you know, all of those kind of things. It really, really is culture, atmosphere, and how you portray and what you want your building to be like. Children who are born into poverty hear a lot less words than children who are born into more advantaged families. And those fewer words that they hear make a big difference in what happens to them in the third grade. Right. This is not just story time, let's amuse the little kids. Right. Um, what they're doing is not only are they sharing new words with children, but they're sharing um, what I would call executive function skills, exactly. where people can step back and think, well, what is the, that character, why is that character stomping up and down? Exactly. Or uh, those sorts of things that make a big difference. So a simple example of story time builds on the knowledge that we have on what really helps children thrive. Right. Infants begin learning at birth. They're learning through interaction. And it's the nonverbal social engagement, the parent being responsive to the child and the child re-engaging with the parent is really the, the very basic, basic beginnings to developing a healthy social and emotional development. And I think this is one of the disconnects that we have in our society is that we, we're not paying attention to those infants up to three years old. That's when we have the opportunity to really engage parents and they're young. Infants read our faces for cues. Am I gonna be fed? Um, how are you feeling, mom? Without words. When infants are denied the opportunity, that reciprocal, if the mother or the father is extremely depressed, for example, then the infant's not getting any cues. The infant begins to shut down. And then we, see, we can see the beginnings of non-medical failure to thrive. I think in terms of long-term investments, when we look at how do we get out of the cycle of violence of people who are disenfranchised, cut off, and feeling the need to lash out violently, where do we work to prevent that in our society? And I think you need to start at that early level with giving children that sense of connectedness in early childhood. A lot of the people that you serve at YDI tend to be lower income. They're juggling a lot. They have a lot of stressors. What are the challenges in engaging them with their child's early learning? Mm. We have many parents who are trying to basically meet their children's needs around the cracks that are left in an already full schedule of simply trying to scrape together enough income to keep their family afloat. Mm -hmm. We try to accommodate families with different types of schedules, pick up and drop off times. We try to make the connections with nutrition. We try to be there to help them with making referrals in the community. Something I notice in working with the families that are referred to me, every month there's a different phone number. Why is there a different phone number? Because they couldn't afford the bill on the one payment plan, because they've moved, because now they're with mom, now mom is with her mom, mom is with her stepdad, and they are moving in different locations, and it's hard to keep one stable location. Three, four, five home settings, and the child shows up in the classroom, and they have a, what are the rules, what are the boundaries, and they're different in every setting. Paula and Dorothy, you are working with in the South Broadway neighborhood with the Family Development Center, specifically on these kinds of... Yeah, well, we're working in four community schools. Manzano Mesa oh, okay. is one of them. So one thing that we've seen happen at Manzano Mesa with a welcoming environment through the beginning with the story time is that Spanish-speaking mothers got together and decided they needed some child care. They wanted to create a cooperative and it started off campus, and that quickly outgrew the small space that they had. Mm -hmm. And so then there was an empty room um, in the school building, a kindergarten room was available. S some of the mothers are bilingual. They attend the parent-teacher association and then bring the information back to the other mothers. At Family Development Program, we're working with the parents 
to provide um, education and training about early childhood brain development, um, developmentally appropriate learning practices, so that when they are in the setting, the cooperative with their children, they're, they're engaging and they're very active. They're so excited about what they've learned about being with their children. There are 90 elementary schools here in Albuquerque, within the Albuquerque Public Schools. So it's critical that, as Linda had said, those leaders are making inroads with families so that they feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Typically, if a, if a parent was not successful in school themselves, or if they've come, you know, from another country, they don't know how to manage the school set setting. It can be very, very challenging and very intimidating. And so they don't even want to come and ask a question, especially if there's a language barrier. But these moms, I mean, they are on fire. They have been empowered. Um, we have a couple of them that are sitting on our instructional council. We have one that's sitting now on our, our PTO group. And they're really voicing and, and fighting for their children. And they're learning how to do that. And I know we talk a lot about in education about the achievement gap. And everybody talks about by third grade, if they're not reading on grade level, if they're not proficient, they're not going to catch up. It starts way beyond that. When they're coming in, there's that achievement gap. And it may narrow, mm -hmm. but it doesn't ever close. And that's because they're coming in at five years old. Right. We need to start way before that. You're and talking I think so in the family utero. development program mm -hmm. when I work in community schools. That's our tagline is school success begins at birth. Absolutely. And so that everyone, you know, we're trying to move toward the, the parents seeing those babies as future students mm -hmm. and everyone at the school when they see the moms walking in pregnant and with newborn babies coming in, seeing them as future students and how do we help engage share those, those, that information with families so that they can see that they can use it in everyday moments to speak to their children, to interact what with their I children. Talk about some of the everyday, what do you teach kids? Like, I don't know, what are the everyday activities that parents can use to do those teaching moments? Things like playing games with kids and then showing how that that helps with the connection. The other piece of that is, is that we talk so much about the social emotional because it's all in relationship is how learning happens, but the intellectual is happening simultaneously. It's not, you know, social emotional over here and, and intellectual over there. Those get siloed sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so when we play mm -hmm. games with children, when we talk with children, I talk about the everyday moments of, you know, you've got to be driving in the car anyways, right? So what games can you be playing that helps promote those um, you know, critical thinking skills, those perspective taking skills, just the communicating the questions that we ask our children. I spy, right. you know, with mm -hmm. the older kids, with little ones, I mean with babies, if they are trying to put a ball on a box, I mean, they may engage in that for four or five minutes mm -hmm. and they are learning. The spirit of going back as early as we can, just in the concept of raising the grandbaby, and the first time I had to change that diaper, and had the child on the changing table by acting like it's a positive event. Mm -hmm. The parents who are going to make the most of that are the ones who are going to, you know, let that child know, I'm glad to do this to make you more comfortable. We're going to have a little routine every time we do it. We're going to change it, we're going to move the toy around. Mm -hmm. Practical. And give them time Keep pushing to it back engage to, to the very and not just like break things up into these little increments. Long before the child can respond. The pressure I think a lot of parents feel is, I have to make every moment count. Here's my to-do list. We're going to explore this. We're going to explore that. We're going to explore that. Go, kid, explore. <laughs> and, um, the idea of building around where the child is at, starting there, letting the child take the lead as a prerequisite for having that quality time, I think that goes into all these learning exercises we're talking about. And I don't think that we're going to address the achievement gap even if we start early, unless we also promote executive function skills, which are helping children learn how to learn. And I think that that's where the science can be so helpful, because it isn't just cramming knowledge into this you know, overwhelmed child or making parents who are working really hard feel guilty. Right. It's being responsive to the child. So mm -hmm. with my little grandbaby, when we're changing uh, his diaper, um, he's now just sees that those wiggly things are his toes. Yes, and so exactly. we talk about 10 little toes <laughs> exactly. and clap your toes yeah. and you know, exactly. he'll giggle. You know, he'll and actually he'll giggle. giggle about it and then put him over my eyes and where am I? And you know, it's just those everyday fun right. things. And they're the everyday routines, mm -hmm. you know, um, and our singing. We sing to babies. Mm -hmm. We rock babies. We 
and when we rock babies, we're developing the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And the rhythm helps again with that regulation. With the Family Infant Toddler Program that's sponsored through Children, Youth, and Families Division um, at the state level, we see infants that come from all aspects of the state, all aspects of, of groups, of parents, all kinds of children, and the services are free. And those are early intervention services. It may mean, it may be that there's a brand new mom who's like, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what to do. And we can offer, and pediatricians can offer, and hospital staff can offer, there's programs here for you where you can have a home visitor that will come out and visit you. And so I wanted to ask Alex, what is the statewide association? That you're, are, you, are you working maybe with other groups to sort of get this information out? As, as pediatricians right now, I feel like we have a tremendous opportunity to, to work with parents. Um, and I think with, within the community as well. I do think the American Academy of Pediatrics, one of their big pushes in the last few years is this whole idea of early brain child development. We've been working with Ellen Galinsky um, in developing a curriculum to make sure that as pediatricians we're educated and that we understand that psychosocial factors like um, domestic violence, poverty, um, just general stresses even in utero actually affect the way the brain develops and the way genes are expressed. Mm -hmm. What we're learning is that the part of the brain that responds to stress develops before the part of the brain that mitigates stress. That's right. That's right. So Absolutely. that makes this even more critical that we understand this and as pediatricians we're in the unique position we get to see the babies when they're a day or two old yes. and we get to see even those first interactions yes. you know the yes. breastfeeding exactly. mom the way she looks at her baby when she breastfeeds mm -hmm. the way the baby interacts with us mm -hmm. and we get to watch that growth and it's exciting for me because I get to watch that bond develop mm -hmm. and if I see if I have concerns that's when it becomes tricky it's mm -hmm. a matter of time resources and accessing other services so that's where it becomes challenging and that's where as, as a state I think we can really work to improve other resources. I want to ask Victor because I'm really interested in the program Generation Justice did. You all decided that young people need to know about mm -hmm. this information. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why and what you guys have Yes, we did um, a workshop called Little Feet Walk Around um, where we try to really inform um, the community about the stages of early brain development and the connections you have to make with children in order to have them be prepared in life and successful and we've done videos and slideshows and everything like that in Why? order to make that connection. Why is it important for like teenagers say, okay. to know this? Why? Uh, um, teenagers are not only our future but they are now, they are present and they have a voice and their voice is important to any conversation going on. And also because these teenagers are going to be parents mm -hmm. one day, yeah. and if we get if we inform them on making that connection with early childhood and getting programs, then they're going to be prepared on what that's all about when they have their own children or or their brothers or sisters or yeah. cousins or anything like that. I have teenagers and they babysit for people. There you so, go. I mean, you know, they're working with children, they're in the neighborhoods, they're the ones. And they do have children. Absolutely. <laughs> we, have, we have a pretty large teenage mom population yeah. in the state. And having worked with a lot of teen moms where they're still my patients as a pediatrician, I'm still taking care of them. Oh, and wow. I'm taking care of that baby. Those, the teenagers are, are critical. And if they have a little bit of an idea, even from a development class in high school, right. God, my job is so much easier if they already have a little bit of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important to have teens talking to teens about this, Victor? Oh, yeah, yes, that conversation is also important because teens can learn from each other, and that's what Generation Justice is always trying to do. Why is this all so important for New Mexico? We just have to shake the concept of how people who are well off can contribute and help move the culture of society along. 
So in Kiwanis, we do have a community service background, and we just have the challenge of trying to get people to be more reflective uh, with how do we spend our time, how do we make things better, do the contributions and the checks we write make a difference or not. We've been able to win a few converts, you know, every year. It's not encouraging. <laughs> it's very slow. So it's sort of like working on the legislature. How many legislators <laughs> can we convince every year to wow. think <laughs> about sooner, the sooner the better? It's uh, very difficult. Yeah. So what should we be doing now? I've tried to focus on two or three areas that are reasonable. One is to work directly with the parents whenever possible yeah. and ask them for what they would like to use in terms of services, not necessarily just Tell automatically them. give them exactly. things. Yeah. The second thing, and one of my personal ideas, is the right book for the right kid. Don't just find a stack of books and dump them someplace. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Read to Me program collects over 50,000 books every spring, but they're very, all that energy is very impressive, but very few people actually go in there and try to take those books and try to deploy them the right way. So mm -hmm. literacy uh, is a direct way to move from the, uh, the prenatal and the uh, early childhood area through this into the school system. Mm -hmm. We have an association here in New Mexico. It's called the New Mexico Association for Infant Mental Health. We work at training and supporting a competent workforce that has special competencies regarding birth through three years old. And then we provide training around the state. Common Core State Standards is, are the new standards that are coming out nationwide. And New Mexico has been at the forefront of trying to implement the the Common Core State Standards, we've rolled them out, kindergarten to third grade in APS. And teachers now are looking at standards differently and they're really immersed right now in developing new units of study and new lesson planning. So we're trying to merge Common Core State Standards and Mind in the Making together. So I think it's a, it's a springboard and it's, and it's a way to think differently and to think about homework should be different because who's going to be helping with that homework? Maybe someone at home, maybe they're illiterate, maybe they can't read. Um, those kind of things. So we're doing lots of things differently and I think it's powerful and I think the time is totally, totally opportune and ripe. Okay, well we're going to add in our leadership. We have some folks from state agencies dealing with us and we'll keep talking about that and how we can progress.